Hi, I'm Greg Lefebvre, and this is The Compulsive Storyteller, a podcast series of short, real personal stories that prove that truth can be stranger than fiction. In this week's episode, entitled Motorcycle Gangs of the Guggenheim, I meet a lovely singer and invite her to the opening of The Art of the Motorcycle at the Guggenheim. The museum's director, Thomas Krenz, has created the ultimate in edgy openings, inviting both black tie patrons and motorcycle gang members. Ironically, the only violence at the event is visited on me. Motorcycle Gangs of the Guggenheim. It's 11 p.m. on June 24, 1998, a quiet Wednesday night along the section of Bleecker Street where all the clubs are located. The bitter end, the back fence, and Terra Blues are all open, but not exactly hopping. I'm walking my dog, Tia. I'm also kicking myself because this coming Friday night is the opening of the blockbuster show of the season, The Art of the Motorcycle, at the Guggenheim, and I forgot to find myself a date for the evening. Passing one of the lesser clubs, my self-abuse is interrupted by the sound of some of the most mournful blues I've ever heard. Through the open door, I can see a woman sitting on the edge of the stage with a guitar, making such soulful sounds that they pass right through my mind and straight to my heart. Her music is so captivating that I talk the guy at the door into watching Tia while I go inside to listen. I'm actually moved to tears. Sadly, it's her last number, and there's scattered applause from the meager audience. While they all leave the club, I come up to the singer and gesture by patting my heart with my hand, saying, wow, you're a fantastic singer. You stopped me in my tracks while I was walking my dog. Why, thank you, she responds in a smoky voice. The crowd didn't exactly seem knocked out, though. My response, Philistines one and all, and she smiles. Then I suggest, I have a crazy idea for you. And she says, okay, let's hear it. I have two tickets to a killer exhibition of motorcycles that opens this Friday night at the Guggenheim Museum. I've never visited the Guggenheim, but I love motorcycles. So why not? You're on. Oh, and by the way, I'm Kelly. And she gives me a very firm handshake. I respond, yes, I saw your name on the poster in the window. I'm Greg. Nice to meet you, Kelly. I squeeze her hand just as hard as she's squeezing mine. The next day, she phones to ask, so what should I wear? Well, the invitation says black tie, so how about a tight black evening dress with a couple strings of pearls? I can do that, she responds. Great, the opening is at 7, and it will be a mob scene for sure, so how about we meet out front at 6.30? My prediction that it's going to be a mob scene is an underestimation. But the crowd isn't just formally dressed museum goers. A sizable number of motorcycle gang members are milling around out in front of the museum. Fifth Avenue has been blocked off to make room for dozens and dozens of motorcycles to park. Most of the bikers and their women are wearing leather jackets with their gang insignias on the back. There, standing statuesquely in the middle of the crowd, is Kelly. Because she was sitting down when we met, I had no idea how tall she was, and she towers over me, standing at 6'3". She is perfectly dressed for the occasion, wearing not only her black sheath spaghetti strap dress and pearls, showing off her well-developed shoulders, but also she has on big, clunky black motorcycle boots. Unlike today, women weren't wearing motorcycle boots back then, especially to a black tie event. Because we were the only couple that bridged the gap between formal evening attire and motorcycle wear, one of the event photographers pulls aside the red cord and beckons us onto the red carpet. 
Flash bulbs are popping everywhere as we walk arm in arm into the double doors of the museum. What a great beginning to a first date. The Guggenheim Museum is a unique circular Art Deco building designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Its interior is unlike any other museum in the world. The walls are a white stucco-like material, the same as on the outside of the building, and it has a continuous ramp that spirals up the side walls all the way to its distinctive deco skylight at the top. Over 90 feet above the rotunda floor and spanning 60 feet, the building's skylight is one of the most iconic in the world. A curved, thick white solid railing sits at the edge of the ramp overlooking the interior. This construction allows viewers to stand at the railing at any point in their ascent and view the entire atrium, top to bottom, and look across at the artwork and visitors on the opposite side as well. The upper railings line up so that each one protrudes further into the atrium space than the one below it, creating a disconcerting feeling for anyone who peers over the edge. It's as if there's nothing underneath you. For the Art of the Motorcycle show, the facade of the railing has been clad with a silver mirrored material that references the shiny chrome of a motorcycle. The exhibition is organized so the visitors start at the bottom of the ramp and walk upwards, viewing the history of the motorcycle with over a hundred different machines arranged in chronological order. Starting with the pre-20th century steam-powered velocipedes and three-wheel bikes, then the earliest production motorcycles, followed by the Art Deco machines of the 20s and 30s. Next are the Harley-Davidsons and Indians, along with the British Roadsters, and on up to the streamlined street racing bikes of the 80s and 90s, ending with the MV Augusta F4. Sprinkled along the way are the Easy Rider bike with its monkey bars, extended front fork, and American flag gas tank, and a large-scale black-and-white photo of Steve McQueen astride his 1962 Triumph TR6, flying high over the barbed wire prison camp fence in the Great Escape. As Kelly and I wend our way up the ramp, I'm impressed that she knows so much about motorcycles. About halfway up, we decide to lean back against the railing and people watch for a while. One of the quote-unquote biker chicks walks by wearing a leather vest, and on her exposed upper arm is a horizontal line with a series of beautifully detailed tiny tattoos of different skyscrapers. While still leaning back against the railing with Kelly, I stop the biker chick and ask, wow, what a beautiful tattoo and so exquisitely detailed. I recognize the Chrysler building, of course, but also that's the Channon building and the Lincoln building. Amazing. She smiles in response, thanks, you're probably the only person here besides me who could actually recognize them, and certainly no one on my motorcycle club has a clue. Just at that moment, her big, burly, beer-bellied boyfriend stalks over, looking none too friendly, and challenges me with a question. You want to see my tattoo? Sure, I respond a little tentatively, while still leaning back on the railing. With that, he lifts his arm, with his elbow pointing toward my face to show off his cobweb tattoo with his spider right in the center of his elbow. As I dutifully examine the tattoo, he growls, Get the fuck away from my woman, and thrusts his arm forward, elbowing me hard in the middle of my forehead. The force of the blow sends me reeling backwards. Had I not had Kelly, a very strong woman at my side, to grab hold of me, I surely would have plunged to my death. The biker then roughly grabs his woman by the arm and heads down the ramp at a good clip. While a big welt grows on my forehead, two different guards, who've observed the event, rush over to inquire if I'm okay. Kelly still has her arm around my shoulder to stabilize me. The guards then rush down the ramp, looking for the biker. A nearby doctor, dressed in his tux, examines my forehead and suggests that I ice it. Another member of the staff who has come over leads Kelly and me downstairs to an office to improvise an ice pack. While I ice my forehead, I say to Kelly, Kind of crazy that in this huge crowd of black ties and bikers, with all the potential for violence, I ended up the lucky winner of the only blow. Kelly laughs, then apologizes for laughing, and a thought occurs to me that I share with her. There are so many lucky coincidences that brought us to that moment. Meeting you while you were singing, getting you to accompany a total stranger to the museum, 
You're being a tall, strong woman able to keep me from tipping over the railing? Crazy coincidences, really. She puts her arm around me again and squeezes, saying that yes, that's for sure. As we take the subway back downtown together, I think to myself, what a fantastic woman. Tall, beautiful, talented. We would actually make a great couple. Who knows, this might turn out to be my lucky night after all. When we get to the door at the top of the stairs to her apartment building, I stand one step higher than her to comically make up for our height difference and then lean in for a kiss, but she pulls back. You're a great guy, Greg, but I'm gay, and I have a girlfriend waiting upstairs. I'd love to be friends, though. I'm completely crestfallen, but I realize that there were plenty of signs there. I just chose to ignore them. After she's gone inside, I turn toward the street, shrug my shoulders, and look up to the heavens, saying to the universe, what a night. The Compulsive Storyteller is written and narrated by me, Greg Lefebvre, and co-produced with Peter Kokoma, who's also made our theme song. If you enjoyed this week's episode, we'd love your help sharing the show. Please subscribe to The Compulsive Storyteller for free on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And also, if you could leave a review, that would be fantastic. Follow the show on Instagram, at The Compulsive Storyteller, and check out our website for more information at thecompulsivestoryteller.com. Thanks for listening, and if you don't like this one, the next one will be another story. The characters and events portrayed in this podcast are based on my truth, with some names and facts changed for privacy. All conversations and dialogues are based on my best memory, but are not word-for-word recreations.